It's great to be back. Uh, I was here last year. It was a, an honor and a privilege, and uh, I was very excited to get the uh, get the invite back to talk more about trees and tree care, and um, hopefully a topic that's of interest to you guys here. So yeah, uh, my name's Chad. We're going to dive into uh, planting. This is sort of a two-parter, um, focusing on sort of the basics of planting and tree selection. And then we're going to take all of that knowledge and sort of combine it into a package in the context of climate change. So let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, so natural systems like forests and, and woodlots, uh, they have benefits we all know, we all love. I mean, if you've ever been out uh, hiking around in a, in a forest and had a, a spiritual experience, you know what I'm talking about. It's very, it can be very moving and, and uh, awesome. But they provide a, a lot of tangible benefits in, in terms of resources, uh, just talking about stress re uh, alleviation, habitat for critters and creepy crawlies and not so creepy crawlies and fuzzy, fuzzy things out there. Um, providing ecosystem services, water purification. They give us all sorts of benefits that are uh, at times uh, just beyond calculation. But also in built systems, and what I'm talking about there are like managed landscapes, gardens, um, anything that is actively managed also provide benefits. Stress alleviation, same sorts of thing. Physical fitness and activities, wildlife habitat as well. So there are some par there are parallels. It's not two different things here. But I also want to go over to to set set the stage here. Culture and what we're talking about when we talk about plant culture. The growing environment of a plant. I know that is as vague as can be, but. The growing environment of a plant can be right around the plant, the soil right here in the rhizosphere, right where the roots are, or even this wider landscape here. It can be zooming up one, one scale here. It can be the neighborhood, the city, the suburb, uh, uh, sort of zooming out one level. It can be an entire area of the country. This is the Bay Area out in San Francisco, and, and this picture is from the, from the Bay Area as well. So culture, plant culture, the growing environment of a plant can be just depending, it can be different things depending on, on the scale that we're talking about, essentially. And the importance of the growing conditions of plants, I argue, is more, even more important than something, say, like pest management, managing diseases and insects and stuff. In fact, I, I think about addressing cultural issues as being 75, 80% of the whole uh, plant growing experience. And if you fall asleep on the cultural conditions around plants, rather than paying attention to what we're dealing with, you can have vastly different outcomes. And this is my uh, adorable dog. Uh, his name is Taiga, T-A-I-G-A. -A. Does anybody know? Anybody familiar with that word, where it comes from, what it means? Siberia. Thank you. It refers to northern forests, primarily in Siberia, Russia, places like that. And he is a snow dog. Loves, loves the snow, loves cold weather. So Taiga is paying attention, and if you pay attention, then uh, the vast majority of your, your plant issues will be taken care of. So what should a tree look like? We're often dealing in environments like this where we've got limited soil volumes, compacted areas where we're trying to grow trees and shrubs, uh, little planting pits uh, along right-of-ways and, and stuff like that. And we need to be taking lessons from the more natural habitats, right? So what do we see here uh, relative to what we're seeing here? We're seeing uh, a, a, a duff layer in the soil. We're seeing nice exposed 
what we call the root collar or the root flare, right, right at the base where you start to see this uh, flaring out of the roots from the trunk into the roots. It's totally exposed. Those tissues are allowed to breathe. Not much competition, not many invasive plants in this picture. And similar over here, uh, we're taking lessons from what we see in natural environments, or we need to be at least. And I argue that people think just because they live out in a, a suburb, uh, not necessarily Chicago, but any sort of suburb or even rural area, that they're kind of spared from the urban uh, issues that we see with trees uh, growing in those environments like this. But I would argue it's every bit of a problem, it can, can be every bit of a problem out in suburban or rural parts of the world. Um, virtually every spit of, of property from here to Iowa has been touched in some way and has been impacted in some form or fashion, right? Whether that's nutrient, uh, excessive nutrient loading into soils or soils uh, uh, being eroded by farming practices and stuff like that, we're gonna have some level of impact. It's just a question of how much. And by the way, uh, I know we're recording, but if anybody has a question or a thought or say, Chad, I don't believe you, throw up your hand, shout at me, do a little dance, uh, get my attention and we'll, we'll address it. But in urban and, and, and suburban soils, generally what we're dealing with is a lot of vertical and horizontal variability. Uh, you see a lot of vertical variability in a picture like this where we see you know, maybe a, a nice organic layer here, but then we go down a couple feet and we start to see uh, anoxic situations. There's not a lot of air or water seeping into these layers. Uh, different, different layers that, tree, that roots of trees and shrubs are dealing with. Modified structural soil leading to compaction. And I can tell you, I live out in the suburbs and the lot that my house is on, super compacted. You can't get a shovel in a foot down into this soil if you tried. So again, it's, it's all the way out into rural areas. Surface crust making soils hydrophobic, modified soil pHs uh, tend to be modified towards the alkaline side, which is not what trees and shrubs like. Restricted aeration, water drainage, interrupted nutrient cycle. We're dealing with a lot of different issues, and I'm mostly talking about soils here, just to focus on something, but there are other issues. So we're dealing with a lot of stressors in trees, very stressful environments. Here's a graphic that I like. I think they produced this at the Morton Arboretum uh, here in, in the Chicagoland area, where it's illustrating an unhealthy compacted soil over here on the right and uh, comparing that to a healthy uncompacted soil where you see roots that are able to extend further out and in compacted soils, they're not able to extend as far out. They're dry. Uh, they they um, uh, lack nutrients, they la lack life. There's often not a lot of microbial activity happening in these soils. And just kind of what that ends in uh, above ground. Uh, and here's another image. This is, this is a study looking at something else, but the, the message is the same. Virtually from left to right, we're dealing with uh, the most compacted soil situation, a moderately compacted situation, and the an uncompacted or the least compacted situation. And you can see right there the performance of these plants. Uh, compacted soils are just not growing as well. All right. Okay, so what do we do about compaction? We're, we're thinking about plant, planting something. So we know we probably have a, a compaction issue on our property. What do we do about that? Uh, ideally, Compaction issues are addressed prior to planting plants, planting trees and shrubs. Uh, it can become, it's not impossible to decompact soils with trees and shrubs already there. Uh, it just makes it trickier, 
more expensive, uh, harder to do. Tilling and uh, that, uh, even just with a shovel, just picking up soil and dumping it out and just tilling it that way, good old fashioned shovel works great, or if you have a rototiller or something, anything to get that first maybe foot at least of soil, preferably 18 to 24 inches down there, and mixing it up, turning it over, uh, making sure that it's not like a slab of concrete under there would be great. It, like I was saying, if tree and shrub, uh, shrub roots exist, there are other things that we can do. Also, uh, at this point in time, if we have soils that are lacking in microbial activity, in uh, organic material, nutrients, things like that, this is the time to make those amendments. If you have compost available or if you have fertilizers available, now's the time to make those. So we've prepped our site. It's uncompacted. Nice, ready soil, ready to be planted in. Now we're going to select a plant. So things that we consider regional conditions, site conditions, and uh, our desires and goals. Often, this is, this is almost always the case, but folks are thinking about these decisions in this direction. What are my desires? What are my goals first? and they're not considering the others. Uh, this really needs to be flipped around. What are my regional conditions? What are my site conditions? Here's an example. Blue spruce, everybody loves, I love blue spruce. I love it to death. It is probably my second favorite tree after red pine. Blue spruce, it doesn't belong in the Midwest. It belongs on the side of a mountain in Colorado, right? Uh, that's where it's happiest well-drained soils, uh, mild summers, not very humid, cold winters, that's where blue spruce wants to be. So those are the regional conditions, the preferences of this tree. And that is uh, what we shouldn't be planting around here. So, Excuse me. Yes? So is the principal reason in this case drainage? Big part of it is drainage. Yeah, we have a lot of blue spruce problems around here centered on drainage. They don't like our soils. Uh, they, uh, it is too humid and too wet here. They get a lot of fungal diseases. So there's a few different things, but that's a huge reason, yes, is site drainage. Is there other spruces that grow better around here? Great question. Are there other spruces that grow better? I haven't run into too much. Uh, Norway spruce. Uh, is a good option if you want a spruce, um, but it's also on its way out in the Midwest. It has, uh, down in places like Cincinnati, it has a lot of problems, and it's only a matter of time uh, how, uh, how bad it'll get here. So we're thinking about regional conditions. What are our site conditions? Do we have a really wet site? What's our, can we take our soil and ball it up like a ball of clay? Can we, can we like make a pot out of it? If it's got that much clay in it, there's a lot of stuff that we're not gonna be able to plant here. So soil texture, composition, drainage, pH, the organic con nutrient uh, uh, attributes of our soils, these are all things we gotta fix. After we address all of this, then we can start thinking about desires and goals and requirements. This is a beautiful yard. But I see problems here. There's a ton of shade in this yard. And there are a lot, of just, just isolating the conifers here. Conifers almost across the board, with one exception that I can think of, are full sun plants, full sun. And planting things like birch and conifer in partial to full shade is going to lead to problems down the road. But after all this, you can start thinking about that. I'll get more into these individually. What I wanted to point out with this slide is think about uh, the above ground structure of a plant that you're looking at in the nursery. A lot of times the nurseries like to make trees uh, uh, flowy with multiple stems, look nice and full, right? That's not what we want because that leads 
uh, this, this looks like a, a tree that you would buy from the nursery, that is gonna lead to a lot of structural issues down the road. All of these little stems are gonna be, become big branches one day. And the trees with multiple branches going all over the place, those are the trees that are prone to have branch failures. We like to see a nice central dominant stem with branches, oh, think of a spruce. A spruce or a fir has a central leader and then branches coming off the side. That's what we want to see. So make sure we're not picking out nursery material that looks like that. Bald and burlap, the oldest, the tried and true way of, uh, of getting a plant from the nursery. Uh, they have often the best species and variety uh, selection available. You can get big old trees from, uh, from nurseries if they're bald and burlap, and they come with soil, which uh, seems weird to say out loud, but uh, when you're not digging out and removing soil, you're also not injuring root systems. So they come with that soil, you're able to plop it in the ground, and they're able to go out from there. Uh, they can be expensive. Transplant shock can be a, an issue with these. Uh, they do require frequent aftercare, mostly in the form of watering. And obviously, because of the size of some of these bald and burlap trees, they can be difficult to transport and plant. And some folks might not be able to do it just, you know, the weekend warrior out there planting a tree might not be able to plant a big three-inch tree with that giant root ball. Often, uh, and also, one thing that I've personally noticed, and I don't know if our, our, our Bartlett arborists have also noticed this, I'm seeing nurseries supply smaller root balls with tr than, than they used to. And that means that more of the root, a, a larger percentage of the root system is being removed. So the tree is being delivered with a smaller root system than it's, than it's used to. It takes more time to recover. So always inspect your nursery stock. Make sure you're getting a, a root ball that's nice and as, as big as possible. After the tried and true bald and burlap, we have bare root. I love bare root. They are affordable. Uh, they have the most intact root system. They're easy to plant. These, these are easy, easy to plant. Pick it up, put it in, put it in the dirt, it's done. Water it, easy. Uh, they're very quick to establish. Tend to only have minor, if any, root defects, and we'll talk about root de defects in a second. Some people might not like the small, the, these are all going to be small. These are all going to be very small trees, if you're familiar with this, very small plants. Uh, some people might not like that. They want something that's already big and uh, uh, instant gratification, instant tree, basically. And you're not going to get that with this. Uh, time is critical. You have to plant these ASAP. So if you got a uh, seedling from outside, please plant that within a week, uh, preferably as soon as you can. Uh, because those roots dry out and it's toast, warm, buttery toast. Uh, availability might be an issue. Certain species or varieties might not be available in bare root. Uh, and uh, planting in the dormant season, early, uh, early spring, late winter, right around then, is where, when you want to plant these. So plant these, although you can certainly plant these in the fall. The, the seedlings you get from outside, you can plant them. Um, they might have a little bit less success, chance of success, but spring is primarily when you want to plant these. Container grown, this is all about convenience. This, is the, this was the latest form of, um, of folks buying trees and shrubs, uh, the last to be developed, I guess. This is all about convenience. Uh, and it's super convenient. There's no rush to plant. As long as that root system of that plant doesn't completely freeze over, you can leave it in a pot for a year or two before you plant it. That's not recommended, but uh, you can if you had to. Planting in the spring or fall is possible. You can plant any time. Uh, there's a decent species uh, and variety selection. The cons, though, these can start to become expensive, the, the container grown. There's a lot of handling of these plants through the process. They're repeatedly up-potted to larger and larger size. More hands on the plants, more times, is gonna equate to higher cost. 
uh, labor-intensive major root, root defects are all but certain. Establishment will take longer because of the root defects we're gonna talk about right now. These are circling roots and these are a huge problem and these have to be fixed before you plant this tree. So from the time it's in the pot, you take it out of the pot, you have to fix these circling root issues or there will become major problems down the road. Um, you see, you can see, this isn't a great picture, but you can see the imprinting. I've heard people say that in talks, the, 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 the pot imprinting. Uh, you can almost see the, the small roots circling in, in these tiny containers. And then as you get to these bigger containers, there's another layer of circling. So every time you up pot that plant, it hits the wall of the container, starts circling. And then they take it out, put it in a bigger one, it hits that wall, and it starts circling again. Okay, these have to be removed, like I said. And that's because you can have situations like this. These are, these are pretty drastic uh, images and, and results here with whole tree failure, but these are ultimately a death sentence for these trees. They will eventually uh, die because of this. But uh, that's what they become because the roots just get thicker and thicker and the trunk gets thicker and thicker and eventually they make contact and it's just bad news bears. So how do we do, how do we prevent this? You tear, you have to tear into that root ball. You have to physically cut out those circling roots. Uh, and that is going to remove a substantial percentage of that root system. There's just no way of getting around it. So you've reduced the root system, now once you plant that tree in the ground, now it's, it's having to recover, it's having to rebuild that root system. You have, but you have to do this, or you're gonna wind up with what we uh, had on the previous slide. We need wide, shallow planting pits, and that is to avoid something we're gonna talk about in the next slide, but folks, I think, often uh, do narrow and deep pits, and that can lead to deep plantings and other issues. So we, we like to see wide and shallow. If you've got a, uh, a, a root ball that's a foot in diameter, make like a three or four foot shallow pit. And when you're planting, You've cut out all your girdling roots. You've oriented everything radially, radially, like the spokes on a wheel. And then you have a, uh, a soil slurry. You put a mixture of water and soil back in there to reduce air pockets, and that'll settle in nicely. So everybody's going, you know, they say you've got to cut out those roots. You've got to remove those roots. You're removing a huge proportion of the root system. Most folks go, oh my gosh, I'm going to kill the plant when I remove all those roots. So let's address that. This was a study that we did back in 2008. These plants, uh, I forget what species, but uh, some oaks and some maples were planted in the spring of 2008. We did down in our lab in Charlotte. And uh, this was the visual condition, just the visual look uh, what these trees look like in September, towards the end of the growing season, uh, after they've been in the ground for the full summer. And the controls that were undisturbed, they were just picked out of the pot and put in the hole, looked great. They, uh, eight and a half visual rating out of 10, that's a, that's a big thumbs up. The disturbed, uh, whether it was just washed or we ripped those, girdling, those circling roots out, Sure, they did not look as great. They averaged about six and a half visual rating. They looked like they were struggling. Uh, something, maples don't really mind to a certain extent you messing with their root systems. So they didn't seem to mind here. Uh, I don't know why this sort of relationship was seen with the maples. But yeah, so that's me admitting you do this, you address those issues you're gonna have some sad looking trees during that season. 
But take a look at the next season. This was midsummer of 2009, so we're a year, year and a half later after planting. Everything is evened out. There is no statistical difference between the looks of these trees. They have all uh, balanced out. After four years in the ground, this is what some of these trees look like. You still see the girdling roots, or the circling roots that are becoming girdling roots. These trees probably won't make it a decade because they'll eventually have all sorts of problems uh, from those circling roots. While you see these roots down here that are all oriented radially, they are good to go for the rest of their lives. By the second year, there's no difference in growth rate or, uh, or uh, quality, visual appearance of these trees. Uh, the, the, for the maples, the number of roots increased. And for the oaks, the root diameter increased. So we're having better root systems in these plants that were, that were disturbed. And uh, ultimately, we have a proper root structure and we have a healthier tree. When you buy stuff from nurseries, they come with these warranties. And remember back to this slide, they were, they were looking great one year. They were looking fantastic. But what you don't want to end up with is a situation where 5, 10, 15 years down the road, you've, in the case of this tree, you've got a memorial tree that is, is going to be toast here pretty soon. So we've got to address those issues for the long term uh, health and performance of these trees. A few other things to note on planting. If you get bald and burlapped, remove, you got to remove the cages. You got to remove the burlap. You can't just pick it up and put it in the ground. Cage, burlap and all, you've got to get those things out of there. And this is something I also see a lot. Uh, I think folks, I think what this is, is somebody just takes the tree, puts it on the ground and then just mounds dirt over the root ball. That's, that's not how we plant trees. Let's not do that. Let's actually dig a shallow pit. Um, so both of these are no-nos, things to avoid. Planting depth. Again, taking cues from nature. This is a, uh, I want to say this is a sugar maple, but uh, was out on a hike in northern Wisconsin. Had to snap that picture because that is the depth at which that tree wants to exist, not up to its ears in soil. Uh, so we, here's a study that we did. We planted cherries and maples in 1996, and then we uh, tracked their survival and dug them out in 2003. We did plantings at grade, where they should be planted, six inches too deep and 12 inches too deep. And you see the cherries, a coin flip. Didn't matter how deep it was planted, six inches, 12 inches, you had a coin flip on the survival there, 50% survival. And that's because these trees were so stressed from the deep planting, they attracted some pretty devastating wood boring pests that took them out. What about the maples? We should start planting all of our maples deep, right? Because they're actually performing the best, right? Everybody not on board with that, okay. When we dug these trees out, in uh, uh, six or seven years after the stud, after they were put in, we saw that the deeper that we planted these maples, the more, essentially, the more girdling roots they had. We just spent several slides talking about girdling roots and how they're bad. So they tend to form these girdling, circling roots that become girdling uh, over time if they're planted too deep. So these trees, are, are dead. They're, they're dead and they just don't know it. It's only the, the clock is ticking on these. Mulch, I could spend, and I have, uh, I could spend this entire hour talking about mulch. Mulch is a fascinating topic, actually. Talking about living mulches, uh, the benefits from a weed uh, management uh, situation. It's just a fascinating topic. It, it, I'm, I guess I'm a nerd or something. I don't know. This is just really interesting. Uh, but there's so many benefits. It reduces soil moisture loss, minimizes weed competition. You guys are capable of reading. I don't need to read all of this. But tons and tons of benefits that simply putting uh, wood chip mulch 
two, three, four inch layer around the base of the tree. So many benefits from that. Again, we're taking uh, lessons from nature here. What, we see organic duff material out in the woods, leaves, sticks, organic debris. Uh, that is what this is mimicking right here. So here's a, a fun little, I'm continually amazed by this, but this is an amazing demonstration here. San Antonio, Texas, too hot for me, not hot enough for others. Uh, plants can survive there. I just, I just can't imagine uh, how hot it is. Soil, we were measuring soil temperatures down six inches uh, below the soil surface. The air temperature during the summer, 105 degrees. In the sun, 130 degrees. Bare soil, so six inches under the soil, bare soil, 102 degrees soil temperature. Under turf, 92 degrees, six inches down. Under three inches of mulch, 76 degrees. It insulates, it buffers the wild temperature swings that you can see in winter, in summer, really hot days. So, and this is where the temperature 60s and 70 degree range, that's where tree and shrub roots want to exist, 60s and 70 degrees. Uh, this also just promotes root, uh, root density of trees. This is under mulch. You can just visually see how many more roots there are, tree roots there are under mulch than under turf. But we have to make sure we're doing this properly. I'm sure folks have seen this driving down in, in the local strip mall or the local grocery store. Uh, I took this picture, and I think this picture myself, just trees buried up to their eyeballs in mulch. That, that is very stressful for trees. So we want to be doing it properly. We want to make sure this root flare is exposed. You see the, the roots sort of flaring out from the main trunk, right? They're not covered up with mulch. So I'm not going to get into the ins and outs, although this is a fascinating graphic. Um, you know this was uh, developed by some, by our uh, friends across the pond because they misspelled program. Uh, but this graphic, in a nutshell, describes how the layering of stresses on top of each other for trees and shrubs starts to initiate this downward spiral process where trees are, are fighting in every direction and they're just sort of going down swinging and losing carbohydrates, losing resources, getting injured, getting stressed. And they're talking about stressors, specific stressors over on the right hand side. And we went over how stressful an urban, a suburban, a rural environment can be. The soils might not be optimum. Uh, we might have pollution issues. We might uh, have a dead soil with no microbial activity at all. Uh, we might have management issues where we have weeds competing with uh, tree roots. All of those stresses lead to pest and disease problems. They attract the critters because they see a stressed tree, they see a, a, a chink in the armor, they see an opportunity to, to live their lives, right? Now, we've got to start thinking about additional, even more stressors than, than what we're um, accustomed to dealing with here. So climate change, everybody's aware at this point. Everybody's, you know, understands the issue. This is just annual mean temperature. I forget what year this is. Oh, um, this is a, a, basically a change in temperature from the, uh, from the, well, this is change in temperature over like the last 40 years. It's getting hotter is basically what's happening. Everybody's on board with that. Average mean temperature. This was also a fascinating graphic that I ran into. Um, it's fascinating because this right here, I didn't realize this was such a problem. Overnight minimum temperatures. It's not cooling down at night. If you know anything about trees, if it's hot out during the day, trees close, uh, essentially plug up their toes. They don't exchange gases. They don't breathe. Because if they open up all of their gas exchange opening called stomata, they're susceptible to water loss. They're trying to breathe, but they're losing water. So during the heat of the day, they close those up, 
They're not losing water, but they're holding their breath. At night, when it cools down and there's less water loss, when, then they open up those breathing holes and then they breathe. Well, if it's not cooling down at night anymore, trees are still going to be losing water. So this is a, an undervalued, underappreciated problem uh, that sort of I ran into and I was just absolutely fascinated by. So uh, pack your bags, we're moving. Uh, we are moving apparently to uh, more or less the Kansas City area uh, by 2080, so over the next 55, 60 years, uh, we'll be in Kansas City where the summers are averaging six degrees warmer and 14% wet, wetter, but in the winter they're seven degrees warmer and 32% drier. Oh. This is a, 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 a resource that's online that you can punch in your sort of metro area and it can forecast out where uh, you're going to essentially be what sort of climate you're going to be in. It's getting wetter here in the, in the Midwest just generally. We're seeing more rainfall. We're not only seeing more rainfall, the, these plots essentially are showing you when it rains, it pours, especially here in the Midwest and the Northeast and, and North Central United States. Um, but generally, it's not like it's a steady rain. When it rains, it rains. That's what this plot is essentially saying to you. And that means when it rains, it rains, soils are staying saturated for longer. Tree roots are sitting in saturated wet soils for longer. If you know anything about tree roots and root diseases, what do fungi and other organisms love? They love cool, they love wet. So issues we're dealing with. Managing what we have. We're just going to brush on this really quick before we get to the, the last bit. Uh, we got to check all of our cultural boxes, all of those growing conditions. We've got to make sure there's mulch, we have proper drainage. If we have irrigation, it's closely monitored. Or in times right, right now, we haven't had a good steady rain in a month-ish. So if you have a tree that you love, go out there and set a hose on it on a trickle for a couple hours, move it around the tree a little bit. Uh, make sure those root collars are exposed. Run through, your, uh, run through your, your checklist here and make sure you've checked all of those boxes. Where it's all about minimizing stress. Species on the edge, things like blue spruce, the Scots pine, the red pine, the white birches, those are, those are for, we got to leave those to the Wisconsin, folks in Wisconsin, folks in Minnesota. They, they still got those as options, not us anymore, not here around the Chicago area. Uh, and so whatever region you're, you're from or, or you're, you're living in, take note of what is sort of phasing out. And uh, I just recommend you stay away from those, those species. If you have them or you insist on planting them, uh, make, it, make sure that you're only planting a few individuals. You're not clumping them up like these spruce. We want to see them spread out uh, because when you clump similar species together, they become disease, pest and disease magnets. They all sort of feed off of each other. Plant resistant or at least tolerant varieties if they're available. Uh, there are uh, resistant tolerant varieties of crab apple to diseases like apple scab and so on and so forth. Um, do your homework and make sure you've got a variety that, that is resistant or tolerant to the, the specific pests and diseases. And again, check all those cultural boxes. We're minimizing stress. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes? Oh, um, this image, you see a lot of this with Arborvitae. <laughs> is that the same kind of thing? I had a soapbox ready for Arborvitae. I took it out because I had time concerns. People, I love Arborvitae, but folks insist on having like a screen for Arborvitae, and Arborvitae want to be enormous. They want to be huge trees. And if you see them touching each other and sort of nudging each other above ground, 
you better believe they're doing that below ground as well. And so we run into all sorts of problems when they're planted close, they get all sort of competition. There are ways around that, maybe we can talk afterwards, um, specific ways of planting arrangements that you can over time deal with the, the competition issues. But yes, people love to do that, especially around these parts with arborvitae. Can be a problem. Pest management, knowledge is your best weapon. Do your homework. Establish action thresholds. That means how much damage on your shrub or your tree are you willing to take before you say, you say doggone it, I'm gonna do something about this. I have to do something about this. All disease management is preventative. This is something I learned from uh, the pathologist that works at uh, our laboratory. He said this to me one time, all disease management is preventative. Once you see uh, apple scab, needle cast on spruce, any sort of fungal disease issue on a plant, it's too late. It's all preventative. You've got to get there before, um, before the disease does. Integrated pest management. I could spend an entire talk. I could spend an entire talk on mulch. I could spend an entire talk on integrated pest management. There are so many, uh, IPM is, is such a fascinating sort of um, uh, process that there's so many facets and so many things to think about, but we're jamming like an hour talk into one slide. So again, we're checking all of our cultural boxes. We're making sure we've got proper irrigation, proper drainage, we've got mulch, we've got proper levels of fertilization, organic material in the soils, making sure this tree is as stress-free as possible. Select resistant varieties, resistant tolerant varieties, we've talked about that. Monitoring regularly. We are out there, we're laying eyes on plants. We're looking for pest issues, we're looking for disease issues. We're even uh, utilizing growing degree days or plant indicators. If anybody are familiar with those, you're tracking, um, basically you're, you're tracking the phenology or the process of things happening during the season. It's a whole different world that's fascinating in itself, but Look up your local extension service. See what information they have on growing degree days or plant indicators. Consider biological control. It's something we do at Bartlett. Uh, we incorporate biological control into our pest management programs. Uh, there are things out there. There are critters, good critters out there that you can buy. There are techniques that you can employ uh, one simple one is simply don't kill the good guys. Uh, <laughs> we have a bit of a situation at our house. Um, I, we have a, a, a wasp nest. I, I usually, I'm not really bothered by wasps um, because wasps are predators and they're voracious predators and they will keep the bad guys away. But I let this wasp nest get out of hand. And now they're all over my backyard and they stung my, uh, my, my spouse. And uh, that's no bueno, Not, I can't allow that. Uh, so now I'm, I'm at kind of a war with the wasps in my backyard. But uh, leaving the wasps alone and letting them take care of the aphids, the, the scale insects, the caterpillars, that, that'll, that'll work unless they sting you. Then, then that has to end. Physical or mechanical control works. This is something I even chuckled at when I, when I first uh, was thinking about it. But our entomologist did a, a project where he went out and scrubbed insects off of the trunks of trees and then looked back and, and looked at the pest populations. And that simple just scrubbing with a brush, getting rid of those things, it works. So don't, don't discount these things. Washing uh, plants off with water or scrubbing them off. We had a huge year for aphids. Um, I could point out aphid damage to you probably everywhere around here. Um, you, you know why we had aphid problems this year? It's because we had no rain in the spring in the Chicagoland area. The rain knocks the aphids off the leaves. So they're not on the leaves, they're not causing damage. We had no rain, we have aphids. 
So washing them off with a hose, simple as that. That can get it done. Pesticides uh, are more than just chemicals. There are some pretty safe to you safe products out there to use around pets and in in areas that uh, that you occupy. I. I don't think pesticides are evil. I think what is evil is the irresponsible use of pesticides. So do your homework, make sure you read the label, make sure you know what you're doing, don't be irresponsible, and they are often fantastic tool. They're just a tool though, in the tool belt of integrated pest management. So we're gonna end with plant selection in this uncertain future that we have in front of us. Again, we're, we're packing our bags. We're going to uh, Kansas City, basically. I've never been to Kansas City, but in 50 some years, I'll basically be there, I guess. What is that journey gonna be like? Is it gonna be, like, ser this, this is a serious question. A scientists are, are talking about. Um, it's, a, it's a way of simplifying the question, but it essentially, we're asking, what, what is happening with the climate as we're moving that direction? We know in tw by 2080, we're gonna be around Kansas City. Is this gonna be a wobbly way to Kansas City? Maybe we head south and get to Kansas City via Southern Illinois and then just kind of level out and wind up in Kansas City. Maybe we take a big old detour and we we go through Columbus and then back through the Appalachians and then into St. Louis and Kansas City. Nobody knows the answers to these questions. These are all things that, that are being studied and being asked. Uh, what we do know is plant hardiness zone. Anybody familiar with plant hardiness zone? You know about what it means? It, it's where, it's how cold and hot the plants can stand. In yes. The Specifically, it's cold, which is, which is something that I have to remind myself too. It's specifically cold. How cold does it get in the wintertime? Um, and around here in the 90s, uh, we were plant hardiness zone five. Uh, as of 2015, which I am sure is almost out of date, we are squarely zone six here in the Chicago area. And this is happening, happening uh, uh, continent-wide. Everything's just kind of uh, moving, moving northwards. So what timeline are we thinking about? Trees live 50, some trees can live 50, 100, 150 years. The oak, the white oak that I have in the, my front yard, uh, maybe 100, 120 years old. Trees live a long time. How are they, the, the conditions that you plant this plant in right now, even 20 years from now, are not gonna be the conditions that it's experiencing. How are we dealing with that? People are talking about breeding with southern populations. So I heard a talk in Pittsburgh a few months ago where they were talking about breeding um, white oaks with southern populations of white oaks. The southern populations are, are um, have developed to deal with the southern the conditions in like Florida and Georgia and places like that. Plants in Pittsburgh and Wisconsin, they're not set up for those conditions. But presumably, if you're breeding these different populations together, you're getting traits from the northern populations and traits from the southern populations. So, how are we mixing and matching these breeding efforts to develop? varieties that will handle the future that they will be subjected to. Uh, informal recommendations, I can say from experience because I have looked, uh, are virtually impossible to find. They are, there are none that I know of, but I imagine there are probably one or two. Few systematically, few studies or projects are out there that are systematically assessing the performance of different species to come up with formal recommendations. And any advice out there is, sca is scattered, it's not very curated very well, and it's often just based on observations. Well, you know, I, I've seen this species do really well here in 
central Michigan or wherever I am. Uh, also, I would add that the production consum consumption relationship is kind of stuck because producers only produce what they think they can sell and consumers only consume what they can consume, if that makes sense, right? So at some point, this, this sort of feedback loop that we have has to be interrupted and we have to start inserting other varieties and other options out there for people. There are people that still plant blue spruce in Cincinnati, Ohio. Just, that's not where blue spruce is gonna perform very well right now. Um, so that has to be interrupted for sure. Uh, oh, there it is. So is it, is, it, is it possible to just, is the answer simply taking a tree species that is growing very well in one plant hardiness zone south and we're just starting to plant it up here? I don't think the answer is that simple. And a lot of scientists are coming to that, have come to that conclusion as well. It's not as simple as going to Southern Illinois saying, what are you guys planting around here? That, I'm gonna pick it up and I'm gonna plant it in Northern Illinois. because so we still have polar vortices, vortexes. We still have winters occasionally here. Okay, so uh, this is something, I was talking about the lack of systematic um, uh, evaluations of different varieties to come up with, with formal recommendations. This is something I'm getting together with uh, some folks at the Morton Arboretum and uh, uh, the, the director of the Boone County Arboretum in Northern Kentucky, where we're gonna set up a systematic monitoring of conifers region-wide. Great Lakes, uh, out west, Iowa, Missouri, maybe over to Toronto, Pittsburgh, New York. And we are gonna take this huge area and we're gonna go out into Arboreta and we're going to see what they have out there and what is performing well at these Arboreta. Ideally, this is done by taking 20, 30 species, identical plants, and just planting different gardens at different locations and monitoring them over time. It takes a lot of money, takes a lot of effort. It's, it's a big undertaking to do something like that. So why not just go out to Arboreta that have a variety of uh, plants and uh, monitor what they already have in the ground? So that's, that's an actual photo, by the way. <laughs> okay, so last I'm gonna leave you with some, uh, because we are in the Midwest, I know we have some folks that'll, that'll maybe tune into this later online, uh, but we'll just really quickly end with Midwest uh, recommendations. These are informal recommendations, things that I have noticed do very well here. So if you're thinking about planting a tree, um, these might be things that you consider. Also, if you go to the Morton Arboretum's website, they have a fantastic resource there where you can uh, uh, get information about a whole bunch of different uh, plant and shrub species. And they'll tell you exactly what the requirements are, what the pros and cons are. It's a great resource. So visit them if you're interested in that. Uh, con color fir is one that I see doing very well here. It's a great plug and play re replacement for blue spruce. It's got that nice shape and that nice color. So if you've got a blue spruce that's not doing so hot, and, but you still want something blue, something to look at in the winter time, consider that. Juniper uh, or, or Eastern Red Cedar, I was not a fan of this, but that's only because I saw it on the side of the road in really bad environments. They're kind of ratty and, and not, not great to look at, but that's before I really thought about this and realized you can prune these to look fantastic. In my neighborhood, there are, there are a few different houses with just gorgeous junipers because they manage them, they take care of them, they prune them, they shape them. Uh, they are, they're pretty hardy. They can, take a lot of, uh, they can take a lot of beating and come right back. Bald cypress, this is another great one. It's, it is native to the Midwest. Uh, no serious pest or disease issues. They can, you can go down to, I don't even think we have a plant hardiness zone 11 in the continental United States. That's like further south than the southern tip of Texas. 
but you can still plant a bald cypress there. Uh, if you're looking for winter interest, they do lose their leaves, so they're not going to be purdy to look at in the wintertime, not like a, a pine or a spruce, but uh, they're doing great. Kentucky coffee tree, consider this one. Get them, find a male if you can. If, the fr if um, fruits and pods and stuff like that uh, would bother you, they do produce sizable pods. Uh, that some people can get annoyed with. So if that's something that, that annoys you or you don't want to deal with, find a male. But these are tanks. They tolerate anything that you throw at them. Salty soils, dry soils, you can plant it in a swamp. Virtually pest and disease free. These are fantastic. I love them. Chinkapin oak, where I think we're giving some, some of these uh, guys away outside. Uh, they are native. Um, they're, they're maybe not as tanky as a Kentucky coffee tree, but I see these doing great in scorching hot parking lots around here. They are green and happy, they can take a beating, uh, and they're, they're doing really well. So think about if you want an oak, a chinkapin oak, or a swamp white oak. These are doing really well around here too. Don't have the root rot uh, disease issues that we see for other species of oaks. Don't have the vascular disease issues that we see. Um, they can be planted in fairly wet soils, but they can tolerate dry soils. So this is another one to think about. Lastly, ginkgo are so underrated. They're so gorgeous in the autumn when they turn color. They turn this beautiful uh, yellow gold color, and they're just they're they're like nothing else. They've got these uh, gorgeous fan-shaped leaves here. Uh, also, as with the Kentucky coffee tree, if the, probably more so with this one, the fruit can, can be a nuisance. So I, I would recommend that you find a, a male, and there are male cultivars available, uh, but these are, these are just fabulous trees. This is a list I compiled of different tree species and different strengths here as far as stress tolerance, uh, drought tolerance, tolerant of poor drainage, tolerant of salt, things like that. Uh, and, and any pest or disease issues for these trees.